I'm pleased to welcome you to the last David Bradford seminar of this semester. I'm Denise Mazerol, a professor joint between the Center for Policy Research on Energy and Environment within the School of Public and International Affairs and the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. Today, I'm honored to introduce Professor Hans Brusnik, who has been the Executive Director of the European Environment Agency since June of 2013. In this era of pressing global environmental challenges, it's critical that countries and regions around the world share their technical and governance expertise to address these challenges as rapidly and as efficiently as possible. That's why I'm particularly delighted to welcome Professor Bruce Nix, an expert on European climate policy development, environmental politics and sustainable development to our seminar series today. Dr. Bruce Nix has undergraduate and master's degrees in political science from Antwerp University and Catholic University in Leuven, and a PhD from Colorado State University in international environmental politics. He's taught in both the US and in Europe. From 2007 to 2010, he directed the HIVA Research Institute in Belgium, a policy-oriented institute where he was head of the political science department. Over the last 20 years, he's conducted and managed policy-oriented research in the areas of environmental politics, climate change, and sustainable development. His academic expertise lies primarily in the field of European and international environmental policy, studying the effects of globalization on the global governance of environmental issues and sustainable development. From this perspective, he's also studied global production and consumption systems, as well as issues relating to distribution and justice. He's taught courses on the topics of global environmental politics and global environmental governance in relation to the European Union, publishing, publishing extensively on EU environmental policies and its role as an actor in global environmental governance. He's been involved in numerous policy processes as an advisory board member on governmental agencies, steering groups, and has been an academic policy advisor to a variety of governmental agencies and other key actors. In addition, he has worked intensively with civil society and business actors in support of public-private initiatives or private regulatory approaches to environmental, climate change, and sustainability issues. Today, he is the executive director of the European Environment Agency and will speak on governing systemic transitions towards a climate-neutral society. During his talk, please place questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll have a discussion at the end of his presentation. Dr. Bruce Nix, we look forward to your talk and insights. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, uh, Professor Mozzarell. Uh, colleagues, it's a pleasure to be with you from across the Atlantic. I, I would have much rather uh, been with you at Princeton University, but for all the reasons that we know, this is not possible at the moment. Um, I will share my screen with you uh, with some slides. Um, if somebody can tell me whether this is working or not, that would be very nice. It looks good. Okay, very good. There we go, Dan. Um, I will indeed focus on governing uh, systemic transitions. That is increasingly the terminology that we use in Europe when we talk about the, the vast and fundamental changes which will be necessary in our society if we want to deal with uh, fundamental sustainability issues. And of course, climate issues are an integral and fundamental part and, and have a lot of political salience when we talk about this. Let me first uh, introduce in a really short time what I represent. I'm, I'm the director of the European Environment Agency. We are part of the EU system and we operate at the interface of science and policy. I usually say science to knowledge to policy because I think science needs to be integrated in a knowledge system if it wants to be really effective in impacting uh, policy and society. We uh, are focusing on timely, reliable, targeted and relevant information in support of policy processes from their formation to uh, their analysis. We are located in Denmark, Copenhagen, and we work together with a network of about 400 national institutions in all the countries of Europe, except for one. And you can see or can hardly see the one that unfortunately left the organization. Uh, we are in essence doing three things. We are uh, working with the monitoring and data 
of the member states, uh, which we then integrate at a European level and make sense of it. Secondly, we do what I call connecting the dots, integrated assessments, where we, for example, look at mobility patterns, the impact they have on atmospheric pollution and then on human health systems. So that, that's a sort of connecting the dots stuff that we do. And the third thing is that through our strong foot in science, we bring innovation, new concepts, new ways of thinking to the policy arena. So that's uh, what we do. And I've had the pleasure since 2013 of, of being the director. When I start uh, this type of talk, I always start with, you know, the obvious for an audience like you. Uh, we are facing unprecedented challenges. And if we are a science to policy boundary organization, we start from the science. And as agency, but also as uh, European scientists, we contribute to these main uh, panels or efforts to bring science together linked to policy and the IPCC, I don't need to say anything about that linked to, uh, to this audience. The IPPES, I usually say, is a lot less known. But finally, we have, uh, at least in Europe, the whole uh, biodiversity ecosystem agenda almost on par with climate change when it comes to attention. A much lesser known panel is the International Resource Panel, which looks at the use of resources on the planet and through the value chain and the physical uh, chain of these resources, what sort of impact they have on uh, sustainability issues. I'm a member of that panel and I will be the global coordinating author for the next global resource outlook. And then we have the World Health Organization, which increasingly we uh, work together with because they make a strong link between environment, climate and health issues. Now, in essence, all four of these give the same message to uh, policymakers and to society. We live in times of urgency and in a pivotal decade, uh, windows are closing to, uh, to deal with some of these issues uh, before they go out of hand. We are dealing with irreversibilities. Uh, in climate change, we speak about uh, loss and damage, uh, the age of loss and damage. Uh, we see tipping points in the natural systems, but also in the socio-ecological systems, as we call them. And uh, on top of that, these things are interconnected. Huh? So increasingly, we understand that without a strong resource uh, policy, we will never fix climate change, nor biodiversity loss, nor uh, go to a healthy society. So that is what, what the basis is. You could also, from a governance perspective, look at these messages as... We live in a governance context that is uh, characterized by complexity, uncertainty, and risk. And those are traditionally things that policymakers or governance actors are not too keen on. So this is a challenging governance context as well. We're not the only ones who say that. Uh, this is the sort of box that is used by the World Economic Forum. The details don't really uh, matter here. But if you go from 2007 to the most recent risk assessment and you look at the likelihood of uh, risks appearing and the impact, you notice that over the years, more and more green appears. And those are the environment, climate, biodiversity uh, risks to uh, the global economy. I take this with a grain of salt, given the methodology, but, but the message, I think, from that world is, uh, is clear. The global response to all of this uh, has been the SDGs. Uh, and uh, I write SDGs again, because for me, this goes to the essence of the challenge that we face. We actually had SDGs before. Uh, we, we had SDGs in 1992. They were called Agenda 21. If you reread the texts of uh, the Rio uh, summit in 92, you modernize the language, you update some of the, the science, you, you almost have an identical agenda. And yet 30 years later, we are less sustainable than what we were committed to then. And this goes to the essence because the real question becomes, what are we going to do very differently in the next 30 years, which we apparently haven't done in the previous 30 years? And all of this has to do with addressing unsustainable systems of production and consumption. Now, you know these graphs, 
They are the great acceleration uh, graphs <coughs> where we look at population increase, GDP increase, which goes faster. That in and of itself is a good thing because we lifted a lot of people out of poverty. But we look at primary energy use, fertilizer consumption, water use. You know, this is all well known to you. But in, in essence, this is what we need to address. Because, of course, we live in a system where uh, this is the impact on the earth systems, exactly the same curve uh, in the graphs, by and large. We always considered those as externalities. But if you look at the top line, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane, you pretty much have the energy system, the food system, uh, the mobility system, and heavy industry. So uh, the link between the two is clear, and that is a starting point really uh, for European policy making in terms of knowledge. Now, we see this type of graph. We now have policies that say that in the next two, three decades, we will at least flatten this curve, you know, stopping biodiversity loss or turn it around. We will become climate neutral. Now, if, if you look at a graph that has been doing this for decades, and now we promise this, the evident question becomes, yeah, how serious are we about bending the trend? And how credible is this? How feasible is this? What sort of policies do we need for that? And what sort of knowledge? And of course, you are totally in, in uh, you know, at the very top of the knowledge uh, field. Uh, we work, I think, with the top of the policy approach to this, and we are tapping into knowledge. So we, we are sort of in the middle of uh, that, that uh, connection. The European answer to uh, this uh, challenging context, we call the European Green Deal. And, and there is also the Green Deal discussion, of course, in your context with a, a number of uh, progressive uh, members of Congress uh, pushing for this. We have a European Green Deal, which I think you can consider as a paradigm shift in politics and policy, at least to a certain degree. Eh? The, the, the seven essential elements of the, the Green Deal are the ambition to become the first climate neutral continent, a biodiversity strategy by 2030 uh, that is world leading, that is the literal language, a new circular economy action plan, which is focusing on keeping the value and the physical uh, materials into the EU economy and closing loops rather than having a circular economic model, a zero pollution strategy. I mean, uh, that's a strong political statement, zero pollution. Huh? A farm to fork strategy, which for the first uh, time, looks at the food system as a whole, links it to health and well-being issues, and is not just emphasizing the farming part of it, the agricultural part of it. A just transition, which again, we have not seen before in Europe, that the social dimension is so in an integral way part of this strategy. And then we link it to two key enablers. Now, one is a sustainable investment plan. I'll, I'll speak about that. And the other one, is a new industrial strategy because it's not Europe's ambition to uh, be in the lead of all these uh, macro uh, intentions and then at the same time becoming an industrial uh, wasteland. Huh? Now, the language that is used about the Green Deal, the official language, which you will find in EU documents and on websites, is that this is the most pressing challenge yeah, that we have, keeping our planet healthy. It's our greatest responsibility. Um, I know that people then traditionally say it's a, it's a challenge and an opportunity, but I focus on responsibility in the first uh, instance. We say that Europe must lead the transition and the word, world, word transition is not without meaning. It really refers to the systemic dimension. And in the first paragraph of the European Green Deal, it talks about existential threats. Now, I can tell you that uh, in the EU policy system, uh, the word existential threat uh, is not one that you use every other week. So it, it is a very clear message and a very sharp break from the policy agenda of the previous European uh, Commission, which in its policy agenda did not even mention the word environment explicitly. Uh, so this is a really a big change. Yeah. 
Um, you can also read this through a different lens, which I think is important if we want to understand the governance of these transitions. I always say this is not a environment and climate agenda for Europe. In essence, it is a political, economic, investment, societal agenda for Europe, and it's, it's framed now as a priority. Yeah? It's a strong systemic transitions logic that is embedded in it. And I think that is, that is absolutely critical. This is no, no longer about incremental efficiency gains. It's really about systemic transitions, which means that also the link to sectoral policies has a very different dimension. Huh? You could say that uh, we've been through three phases of sectoral policies. One is, please don't pollute so much. The second one was, could you on top of that become more efficient in, in all sorts of ways? And the third one is, could you please reinvent yourself within the boundary conditions of uh, the Green Deal? Yeah? Then it's totally interconnected, and I will illustrate that. It has a much longer time horizon uh, towards mid-century. That's rather unique in policy settings. This strong social dimension, the link with innovation, but also digitalization, I'll come back to that. And it is a governance agenda. And so it's ambitious, innovative, interconnected, and systemic. Now, I'm not naive. Uh, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating and, and in putting this to work and in translating this into a strong legislative agenda. Because Europe is, a, of course, a, a yeah, regional organization uh, for Europe. What distinguishes it from ASEAN and uh, Mercosur and a couple of other organizations is that when Europe comes with a legal agenda, it is legally binding and it supersedes national legislation in terms of setting targets and uh, in, 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 in terms of pushing an agenda forward. So as part of this agenda, first climate neutral continent, Europe now has a European climate law. Uh, the law came uh, last summer. Uh, it is a law that states a couple of things very clearly. Uh, it says that we will be climate neutral by 2050. That is now embedded in the law. But it doesn't only speak about the really long term in the abstract. It says that by 2030, we have to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 55% compared to um, 1990. Yeah. Uh, this has to be done with domestic measures, and there is a strong external dimension as well that I, I will speak to. Um, what is now being done is that Europe is looking at current legislation in all sorts of sectors, going from aviation to the maritime sector to traditional uh, transport sector, the agricultural sector, um, land use, forestry. Uh, the housing sector, uh, you know, you name it, it's in there to check whether the current targets, the current trajectories, the current what we call PAMS policies and measures, which the member states mostly report to our agency, whether they are fit for 55. That is the language now. Is this fit for 55? And this is leading to serious analyses. Uh, uh, we call that impact assessments. Uh, and countries have to contribute to this Fit for 55 package uh, uh, analysis. If needed, these uh, sectoral approaches, these uh, you know, cross-cutting issues will be addressed and will be brought in line with the minus 55 package. The external dimension is also important. And we just last week launched a new forest strategy, for example, which will not allow uh, for imports that lead to deforestation uh, linked to the food system, for example, or to building materials. Uh, and that will be monitored amongst, uh, you know, with, amongst other um, uh, technologies by our Copernicus uh, Earth satellite uh, information that, that we then uh, will, will do with uh, the member states and with the European Commission. So this is a really strong agenda if you compare it to what we had in the past. If you want to understand how much of a change that is, Europe has since 1990 been on a downward curve uh, on uh, greenhouse gas emissions. 
uh, we are about here now eh? with COVID, it took a dive. If we look at where we have to be in, 50, in uh, 2030, minus 55, and then net zero emissions, eh? we will be at about five to 10% emissions left over that we will compensate uh, with uh, Lulu CF measures, uh, with carbon capture and storage technology, and with uh, embedding carbon in materials and, and in other applications, we will have to speed up our annual decarbonization rate by about a factor two and a half. And the clear message is that this is absolutely impossible with current methods. It is not about slowly improving what we already have. We will need to speed up and scale up uh, totally new approaches, which is in line with the paradigm shift idea. More about this uh, a bit later. What I want to show now is that the biodiversity strategy, uh, which uh, has two serious contexts that are innovative, restoration of nature and nature-based solutions, is not just the biodiversity strategy. Uh, it talks about uh, uh, making nature healthy, it's for our well-being, yeah? it's linked to disease outbreaks and so health, uh, it's linked to recovery, uh, and Europe has liberated about 750 billion euros to stimulate the recovery out of the corona context. And that, that will also have to be put onto biodiversity issues. But it's also linked to the fight against climate change because nature restoration, I'll give you an example. Uh, Ireland is going to, on a, on a very serious scale, restore its peatlands and wetlands uh, to restore the carbon capture uh, uh, potential. Europe is going to plant 3 billion trees uh, in the next uh, decade, and we will be monitoring that and uh, looking at, at the impact. And nature-based solutions for climate adaptation are really the name of the game now, rather than gray solutions. So the link between these strategies is very strong. Uh, in, the, in the heads of policymakers, and we now need to make this happen uh, in, in what we contribute to, to the policy process, and, which also means that we are linking things that, uh, yeah, we know these precipitation maps and for Europe, the biggest, uh, the biggest problem will be the Mediterranean region with a lot less precipitation, also quite a number of areas with more precipitation, including... Uh, the little country that I come from, Belgium. But th th these are nice graphs and maps, but increasingly European citizens are understanding this as the following. Yeah? This is climate change that is happening. It has an impact on our lives. Uh, the, these were the floods in Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg of just a couple of months ago. And this was the Rhine River. Yes, the Rhine River two years ago in a very similar region during a period of extreme drought. And here we are looking at climate adaptation, which is part of the law, working with nature. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that makes this connection. And then, of course, the social dimension. The same is true for forest fires, which, of course, is nice to monitor and to model and all of that. But if you look at yeah, high emission scenarios, huh? this would be business as usual. Look at where we would have forest fires all the way into Norway and Sweden. Um, so th th there are serious issues that connect socioeconomic well-being to how we work with nature in a context of extreme uh, consequences of climate change. The same is done for the climate change and health nexus. And this is West Nile fever and where by mid-century we would see a conducive uh, temperatures and ecosystems for West Nile fever to spread. Uh, we have set up together with our Center for Disease Control called ECDC and a number of other institutions, a platform to link climate data to uh, health data and to look at what this will bring for the future. Again, a connection. Uh, it's no longer fragmented policies. It's increasingly focusing on connections. The same with uh, the value of farmland, uh, really important. Look at the Mediterranean farmland value losses by the end of the century of uh, yeah, 70, 80 
percent and more well the farmers that might be still alive at the end of the century are born today uh, this has really serious consequences on all sorts of levels so we start to look at these things as really systemic game changers huh? that also of course includes things that are very familiar to you the geopolitical impacts of climate induced human drama and here's a little anecdote that i can say i ended up studying in the us because when i suggested in 1991 to my professor at the university in belgium to work on uh, climate change the impact uh, on uh, social violence and wars and then this type of link that you see on these images the response was uh, well a phd has to be on something serious so I, I then went to the US, did my PhD work there. And the end of the anecdote is that I became the successor of this professor at the same university. So the circle was, uh, we, were, we went full circle. Anyway, another critical element in the European thinking about moving to a zero carbon society is um, circular economy. Yeah? If you look at the embedded carbon, in materials from how we dig them up and how we process them and how we use them and then discard them, there is no way we will come to zero carbon if we do not focus fundamentally on circular economy. And this was a concept under the previous uh, commission primarily. The current plan is really focusing on sectors, the textile sector, the furniture sector, uh, some of the critical materials that, that we use to a large degree in all sorts of things like steel. So we are really focusing on that element. There is a lot to be said about that. I don't want to do that now. That would be a lecture in and of itself. But it's really important to understand that those things are looked at as a, as a package deal. You can no longer separate them. And that, that generates uh, different dynamics in the EU system. The zero uh, pollution ambition is aiming uh, not only at uh, yeah, pollution uh, coming from a variety of sectors and the impact on, on biodiversity and human health, it is also, also linking this to uh, zero, uh, to circular economy and to uh, the fact that if we want to make our products more circular, we will need to focus also on uh, their polluting components and, and the toxicity of products and the materials that go into them. So again, there is a strong connection between these elements. Now, if you look at this whole package, you need to think and reflect of where we come from. We, every five years, make our flagship report called SOER 2020, State and Outlook of the Environment Report, where we bring together our best knowledge. It's sort of our... A global Environment Outlook Report for Europe. We look at the main chapters in the European policy. Huh? And then every we call this the piano of the European environment. Every key on the piano is a set of policies or a policy for which we have data indicators. And then we give a, a, a simple color coding scheme uh, to speak to policymakers and broader audiences. And if you look at the past trends, well, it's a mixed picture. What is uh, very clear is that we have not paid enough attention to our natural capital and the foundational capital. But what is very concerning is that when we looked at the outlook and we did trend lines and projections and, and scenarios, the green almost disappears. Now, this is on the continent that has the most integrated, most ambitious, most binding set of environment and climate uh, policy targets of any place on the planet. If this is the outlook, there is a sort of crisis in the system. Huh? And, and so our conclusion was that business as usual and also business as usual plus, which means let's do what we do a bit better. In other words, policy implementation needs to improve and we see progress, but we need to speed it up a bit is no longer an option. Huh? So we are very clear about uh, the need for systemic change. So we are organizing our knowledge no longer uh, primarily as a, uh, water and air and no we look at the food system we look at the energy system the mobility system and the built environment as key systems that provide human well-being uh, and social cohesion and should guarantee human health 
And those need to be organized within yeah, the boundary conditions of the 21st century, which uh, you can call them planetary boundaries, or you can use any other term you want, but, but that is what we are facing. So we have to go to the fundamental drivers, systems of production and consumption, look at the interlinkages in the system. I've been emphasizing that, adopt transformative policy frameworks, and fill crucial policy gaps. And in Europe, we had a number. Eh? In 2020, we talked about the food system that is now in the Green Deal, land and soil, which are critical uh, in so many ways and was not a priority uh, competence for the EU. That is now we have a land and soil law that is coming that will be essential. The chemical strategy, I'll speak about that, and this social dimension. This is a social transition. So the social dimension is critical. Of course, it also means that you need to work with actors across the board, but I, I will not dwell too long on that. Now, if we want to think of uh, systemic challenges and transitions, we want to start from recognizing their deep character. Also, the fact that there are most likely no silver bullets to solve complex challenges. We need to understand the lock-ins also in social practices and paradigms. And very important for me is that we focus on barriers to fundamental change. And I'll come to that. A couple of illustrations, a silver bullet for a long time, we thought that we could uh, go to more efficient combustion engines and that would end up in a good place. In Europe, we've been pushing for that for a long time, uh, but, but clearly you cannot decarbonize your mobility system based on a combustion engine. So the silver bullet became the biofuels. Well, if you look at biofuels and you think of it, and you think of a lot of that as using agricultural land of high volume to grow virgin crops, which you then transform into a fuel, which you then mix for five, 10% in a fossil fuel to throw in a 19th century technology that has 25% efficiency on a good day in something that weighs a ton and a half that we occupy with 1.2 person uh, on average to drive uh, distances below 10 kilometers and 10 miles for sure in Europe. I mean, really, did we really ever believe that that was the smartest solution we had for mobility and that that would be the silver bullet? And I'm not even talking about the consequences uh, in competition with the food system and with biodiversity. So then, of course, uh, it's electric driving. And of course, it's a, it's a new technology. But this would still be the main street of Brussels, looking down from the European institutions about 10 hours a day. Yeah? Uh, and probably this guy on the bicycle would be the true, uh, truly innovative uh, character. Huh? So then this is a bridge close to where I live in Copenhagen. Copenhagen is completely investing in this type of mobility, uh, 83% of the urban mobility is walking, cycling, and public transport. It's 30 years of continued investment and vision. So this is a solution, of course not. We're not all going to be on a bicycle the whole time. So we, we need to integrate and find a solution of an interconnected uh, sustainable mobility system that offers uh, the facility that we need, but also stays within those boundaries. So it's a really complex thing. And if you start from, a, from that sort of perspective, it's clear that silver bullets don't work. The same is true for the digital panacea. Uh, if we make it digital, it will be better. Well, really, uh, is that how it works? For me, there is no, uh, no uh, automatic link to that. And, and I know this is pushing it and probably stepping on some toes, but I'll say it anyway. They're, they're, this world is dominated for now by, you could say, the North American model and, on the other hand, the Chinese model, one that is focusing on market and pushing consumption. The other one uh, has a strong control aspect. Uh, the challenge, I think, for Europe is to find a space where we can make the link between digital and sustainability and digital and citizenship. So we stay with the C, right? consumption and control, but citizenship, the commons, uh, and, and building a society that, that meets the challenges of the future. And uh, in, with the German presidency of the EU system, we have really been focusing on digital and sustainable linkages. 
another bullet has been the silver bullet, the policy integration idea. If we make agriculture a, a bit more sustainable by embedding it in uh, some of the policies in Europe, that is a common agricultural policy, we will green it. Well, these are the nitrogen loads in Europe. Uh, the European Court of Auditors has written a fairly strong report that illustrates on top of all the other science and policy evaluation that there is that this is not functioning. So we need, we need to have a look at the food system and understand the lock-ins and the common agricultural policy and its funding schemes is part of the lock-in. Huh? We of course also have consumption habits. We've got small, relatively small industries that uh, focus on technologies of overfishing that are unsustainable. And then we also have the social uh, dimension often in the food industry that, that is absolutely not compatible with strong social sustainability. Another risk which we see is medium termism. There is a bit of this, a lot of discussion now in Europe on uh, gas fired electricity plants as a transition uh, energy. Uh, of course, this also links us geopolitically to the whole situation in the East with uh, Russia. But we did an analysis of all the units in Europe that are gas fired or coal fired, how the investment plans are in these in line with legislation to modernize them and be in air quality rules and all of that. Well, we estimate that 20 to 30 percent of them could be stranded assets by 2030. So medium termism uh, becomes a new uh, fundamental issue to analyze in, in uh, sort of foresight and scenario exercises. Then this one is uh, even more fundamental, I think. Uh, Europe now has a chemical strategy that starts from the principle of safe and sustainable by design. And that is very much informed by work of Paul Anastas, your colleague at Yale University, and a number of other scholars who are the founding fathers of green and sustainable chemistry. And of course, this is not a Mendeleev table, but if, if you go to the article and read the details, it's a, completely re, a complete rethinking of uh, the chemicals in light of human health, in light of other uh, objectives, because my colleague, the head of the European Chemicals Agency, says very clearly that the current molecules which we use and produce are not compatible with climate change objectives, not with circular economy, not with biodiversity restoration, and not with human health. So we will have to reinvent the chemicals industry. Huge challenge. Then if we go to the core of the system, the financial system, and why do I call it the core? Well. Uh, in Europe, we're a bit more soft-spoken when it comes to the role of finance. We call it the market economy or the mixed economy. I think in the US, you are more uh, yeah, outspoken about it. You call it capitalism. Huh? In a system which we call capitalism, it's not called naturism or, or societalism or workerism. It would be bizarre to expect radically different outcomes in terms of sustainability without addressing the core of the system. So Europe has developed a sustainable finance system now that is built on a taxonomy that defines what sort of uh, investments are in line with, you could say, the objectives of the European Green Deal and where we want to push through regulation, monitoring and reporting uh, the financial system. As an agency, we will play a role in making sure that this is not greenwashing. So we are working with the European Investment Bank and with a number of financial institutions uh, to make this taxonomy work. This is really critical in the system. Why? Because a lot of the investments that we make, and I use the decarbonization trend line here, we are used to investing in what you could say marginal efficiency gains. We focus on the current technologies or, or you know, mitigate them a bit, make them a bit more efficient. That's where a lot of our policies are going. And, Marginal efficiency gains, according to economists, are increasingly expensive. That's the uh, concept of marginal cost. Uh, engineers will tell you that they are increasingly difficult to reach. There is a sort of tangential uh, limit to uh, technology and, and their uh, marginal efficiency gains. 
And a transitions thinker will say they will never get you to where you have to be. What we need is not high cost uh, marginal efficiency gains that could lead to stranded assets. And for that matter, also to stranded regions and stranded workers, but we need breakthrough investments. And that is where the sustainable finance taxonomy plays a role. The EU budget is making a clear statement. The stimulus fund that I talked about uh, plays a role. And the European Investment Bank and, and the European Central Bank are really taking the lead in profiling themselves as climate banks. And another element is a societal change, uh, socially uh, just transition, uh, leaving nobody behind. This is, of course, about vulnerability, uh, resilience, uh, the modern term that everybody uses now, and the just transition. I think it's fair to say that in almost all political contexts, this social dimension is underdefined. We have a rather poor knowledge base about this. Those are two different worlds, uh, social uh, statistics and, and analysis and environment and climate, they have been very segmented. So we, we need to bring this together. We are trying to do that with the agency. Um, but this is also linked to fundamental debates on distributional issues. And we know how societies have evolved there. Huh? For a number of years, I, I read uh, the State of Working America that was produced uh, in, the, in the Washington uh, uh, Beltway. Uh, it, it, these, these issues matter, yeah? And it also links Europe, in our case, to the rest of the world when you talk about societal issues. So if you then look at what we call the X-curve of transitions, the focus is on the intrinsically optimistic curve. Uh, we, we will experiment with new technologies, new business models, new governance models. We then accelerate them. We institutionalize them. Europe is trying to do that in a number of ways. And then we are in a better place uh, in a new stable sustainability context. What we don't do enough is uh, focus on this. What should we be phasing out, breaking down, yeah? destabilizing dominant parts of the system? Uh, and you can, that's of course, we know that that's where the conflicts will be because yeah, people may lose their job and and we need to come up with enabling uh, conditions there. So the social dimension should not become the next externality. We should use our knowledge and intelligence to embed this in how we are dealing with these issues. And what are we talking about? Of course, and obviously, the phasing out of fossil fuels, environmentally harmful subsidies. We've talked for 30 years about that. It's about time that we really address them. Uh, unsustainable tax systems unsustainable spatial planning and often forgotten dimension, but which is absolutely critical. And then unsustainable inequality and living conditions, which in my opinion are also not compatible with strong sustainability. Now for that, we need to ask ourselves the question, what do we know about these two curves, the red and the green one? Do we know where we are on the curve? Do we have the data, the statistics, the understanding, the expertise? And how is this integrated in policymaking? That is partially what the Green Deal is about. And, and policymakers realize, because the Green Deal mentions increasingly that we need to speed up some of these elements. It talks about urgency, acceleration, rapid phasing out. Here's the term, yeah? Action to be taken the next five years, uh, industrial transition, breakthrough technologies, and thus investments zero carbon steel by 2030. So we are really starting to focus on that. And mechanisms to speed up that transition are of course working on institutional setups that are fit for purpose, the fit for 55. The phasing out of non-sustainable practices, which is now a discourse that is used in a very strong way by our top policymakers in Europe. Uh, role of investments in capital, you can go down the list. Uh, a bullet point that I find interesting is a race to the top logic that we need to bring into our financial system, our tax system, our regulatory system. The race to the top should be the one that determines also the economic uh, viable practices and where profits can be made. Now, there are implications for knowledge creation, organization, and use. Huh? The new policy landscape is pushing us 
from what we call the environmental key, environmental legislation over 2025 to 2030 to 2050. So that's an increasing trajectory of sustainability with long-term challenges, going from ecosystems to climate resilience, climate neutrality, a regenerative economy, which is an official objective now, and so on and so on. That means, and now I'm, I'm landing in Princeton, that one can bring in Thomas Kuhn, who uh, wrote uh, the seminal work, uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions in the early 60s. And we've been applying this thinking not only to explain scientific revolutions and the need for paradigm shifts, but also uh, when you look at fundamental science and knowledge, I think it has been going through a sort of paradigm shift. We see this landing increasingly in European policies, at least the perspective of it. And we have to ask ourselves the question, are we putting enough effort in connecting those two and creating the understanding that we will need for this? And I, I can illustrate this, but it would push me too far. But if you look at Kuhn in the pre-paradigm phase, where he, he says in his language that we start to use terminology new terminology, we don't really know how to measure things. So we're looking for new uh, indicators and data and, and, and uh, evidence. This is where we are. I mean, we've been talking for the last five years about the green economy, low carbon economy, circular economy, blue economy, bioeconomy, digital economy. In the end, it's one economy. Yeah. And they, they will have to be understood in a transitions logic. So we will need to build a new system that links our scientific understanding of systemic dynamics to a policy reality, and that is able to connect the two. And one of the ways to do that, I'm emphasizing one of the ways, is to create new paradigms also in how we can connect those. And uh, you know the, the wicked problems uh, uh, understanding uh, where you can focus on uh, the connectivity, multi-causality, multi-scalar. That sounds like where we are. Huh? Solutions that are not right, not wrong, but better or worse. Every solution ramifies throughout the system. All these things we know. Huh? Then you, you may know uh, of your, your colleague from Yale. Actually, he's now in uh, Singapore. Uh, who has, with, with some of his uh, colleagues, written this article on super wicked problems which have additional characteristic, time is running out, policies discount the future irrationally, uh, you know, th th no central authority. This very much sounds like a paradigm that we could use to connect fundamental scientific understanding to uh, challenging policy settings. It means that we need to develop knowledge that reflects problems that in our understanding means uh, focusing on co-creation at the science policy society interface and also making a different type of use of policies. I will skip this slide uh, and this one as well, because I would like to land and leave enough space for, uh, for discussion as, as I agreed with the organizers. I think there is enough reason to look at the European Green Deal as a potential paradigm shift in politics and policy. I think it's, it's well embedded in science. It has a number of logics that, that really aim to come to a different governance dynamic. And it also begs almost for a knowledge system, a system of understanding that, connect, uh, can, that can connect the dots. So is it a paradigm shift in politics and policy? Yes, if we can implement it. Yes, but we say in Europe, this will not only depend on Europe or on the, the government, on public institutions, but, but on much more. And it also means that we need to have the courage to take this agenda for what it is. And for me, it's an agenda of uh, societal transitions. So we need to focus this policy domain also on how to improve conditions of well-being. There are serious issues of that in our societies. Eh? How can this agenda be used to strengthen social capital and social cohesion and not only natural capital? Of course, within the limits of our relationship with natural capital, 
how can future visioning also be based on ethical considerations about what type of society we want to live in? That's a strong discourse that is now brought to the table by the top figures of this agenda in Europe, including Franz Timmermans, the executive vice president of the European Commission. It also means that we need to recognize that current metrics that dominate the debate about economic performance are part of the problem and that we will need to innovate in understanding societal change and then finally doing something about it after decades of theorizing. Because a lot of what I said has its intellectual and scientific rules actually in the 1960s and 70s and 80s. So uh, I am extremely encouraged to be part of this exercise in Europe. Uh, it motivates me every single day to, uh, to do the best we can do as an organization. And it uh, is extremely exciting to be in this transatlantic dialogue now and to listen to uh, what you make of uh, my 47 minutes of babbling away. Thank you very, very much. Great, well, thank you so much for that inspiring and optimistic uh, presentation. Um, we only hope that both the European Union is successful and that the lessons learned um, will be shared globally. Um, rather than asking the first question myself, in the interest of time, I think I'll turn um, to some of the questions that have been posted in the Q&A. And I invite others to post more there now. Um, Professor uh, Bob Cohen asked the first one. Um, Bob, would you like to uh, go ahead and um, ask it yourself? Yes, thank you. Th thank you for the presentation. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, good. Yes, I can hear you. You spoke of, of the systemic challenges and the ways in which problems interact with each other. But we're all, we all see trade-offs in, in real policymaking there are trade-offs between values. Not, not all good things go together. So you didn't emphasize the trade-offs. What are the trade-offs you see and how are you gonna think about when, when values that, that we care about, for example, the social dimension or, or the rapid, rapid shift in energy transition come into conflict? Uh, thank you. Uh, Denise, do you want me to address these questions or take three at a time and then address them? Yeah, What's your you preference? Ahead. Why don't you go ahead and address it? Okay. Well, uh, Professor uh, Kyohane, I, I have to say I, I had to read a lot of your work in grad school. So it's, uh, it's actually quite amazing that you ask me a question now. Uh, so it's an honor to be in, in, in your presence, actually. Um, of course, there are trade-offs. And we mapped the SDGs against each other based on work that was done by the Stockholm Environment Institute and our own work and, and some academics. And where you, of course, see the difficulties and the trade-offs is where I would say the production and consumption SDGs are crossed with the natural capital SDGs, if you want to. And I think part of that, uh, of the trade-offs is in distributional issues. Yeah, the, the idea that uh, yeah, we can grow ourselves out of uh, inequality by not fundamentally addressing it, uh, I don't think is uh, tenable any longer. It is part of the global resource outlook work that we are doing now, where uh, distributional issues and well-being issues are very central. Uh, and I think the trade-off in societies where yeah, wealth uh, creation and wealth, uh, how do you say that, concentration has a specific dynamic that is deeply embedded in all sorts of systems. I think there is a clear and difficult political trade-off. In Europe, we also see a real trade-off with the external dimension. Our external footprint uh, is part of the discussion now. Uh, and that is a trade-off in many ways, because, of course, uh, literally in trade, I mean, if you no longer import things, there is a trade-off on the other side. If you have a border adjustment tax on climate, which is part of the European uh, policy package now under the climate law, there is a trade-off uh, when it comes to, uh, to free market uh, 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 trade of, of goods and services. Um, I also see a trade-off in an intergenerational uh, way. 
uh, which plays out very strongly in Europe with, uh, with the youth uh, movement that is asking these questions, but in an intergenerational uh, way. What is the trade-off of you now making this decision for our generation? So I think this whole discussion is full of uh, trade-offs, uh, going also to personal, uh, personal choices. Uh, what diet are we on, uh, you know? Uh, all of those choices are part of, uh, of, of these systemic changes. So uh, I hope I didn't, uh, in my, my sort of optimism, became naive or, uh, or sent a message that I think this will be easy. I think this will be incredibly difficult to do. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Professor, Professor Elke Weber has posted a couple of questions. Um, Elke, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, let me uh, post the first one. I completely agree with your points about no silver bullets, but I'm wondering if you could say a bit more about how concretely we will be able to get rid of lock-ins you know, or misguided subsidies in the light of political realities, you know, both in Europe and the United States. And maybe also a word or two about what processes and what participants will be needed to come up with these creative multi-pronged solutions that you've uh, mentioned, like in the transportation sector or, or in, in any other sector. Okay, thanks. Uh, great questions also. I, I think the subsidy uh, question, I think in, in Europe, um, in a way, is maybe simpler than in North America, because we've got a rather explicit system of uh, subsidies that is rather well mapped uh, in what we call a mixed market economy. I mean, the role of, of public intervention in that economy to, has been rather large uh, traditionally in, in overt ways. And the message we sent uh, in, in a sort of generic way is this is the European model. Yeah. We, we are not saying to take this money, this public money out of the economy, but you need to come with a five, 10 year credible pathway to keep the money in there, but to shift the teleology of it, to shift the macro uh, orientation of it and then there will be actors that, uh, that can keep up and they will benefit from that. There will be those who try to uh, you know, hang on to the old model and those will be uh, the losers, if you could say so. And of course, we know that there are sectors that will disappear because they are not part of that sort of future yeah? or not at least under current technologies. But yeah, that's where we have theories of creative destruction of... Uh, you know, innovation theories uh, that, that we, I mean, I, the city that I come from in Belgium, Antwerp, has a wagon maker street. Yeah? There is not a wagon maker to be found there. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And still the economy didn't collapse. People still have a job. We are still mobile. Uh, we found other solutions. So to that extent, I think the lock-ins, we need to address them in ways that do not destabilize the system, but that speed up uh, and scale up the change of the system. And therefore, we need, we need uh, I think, in the European system, a clear link to the uh, public sector targets, timelines, and the use of public money, about 45% in the European economy, uh, if you think of uh, the GDP and the taxes. And if you think of the financial system, this pushing under the the sustainable finance system really can play a role. And hereby, I hope that I also mentioned a couple of the, the participants, the, the actors that I think we need to get on board. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. I think we're running short of time. I just have a quick question I might pose before we close, which is that um, the European Union's um, plans look extremely promising if they are successfully implemented. Um, and you touched just briefly on the role that the European Union might play in increasing sustainability internationally by mentioning um, financing, um, sustainable financing. I was wondering if you could say a bit more about concrete measures or timetables or projects that are actually um, planned or expected in terms of ensuring a more sustainable um, international financing program. Yeah, I, this is a really interesting one because um, we notice that since four years, we've been working on this sustainable finance uh, dynamic. And very early on, there was a huge interest from a bunch of actors also outside of Europe. 
Um, and we see now that this taxonomy, but also the, the whole monitoring and reporting that will come, the role of the European Investment Bank draws huge attention from not only other multilateral uh, banks, but also from private uh, investment uh, companies of sorts. Uh, and in, in a way, if I trained as a political scientist, for me, this is a regime theory uh, uh, where, uh, you know, you have norms and values that shape the expectations and the behavior of actors in a given domain, uh, if I can remember uh, the definition from 30 years ago. Uh, and so um, th this is what you see happening. Uh, I mean, there are quite a number of actors that don't have to follow these guidelines yet, but they are starting to follow it. I mean, you have banks now advertising here in investment companies, although there is no legal obligation yet that they are complying their portfolio to uh, this sustainable finance uh, thing. Yeah. And we see the same outside of Europe. So I think this is one of the ways in, in which we can, we can yeah, externalize maybe part of what we are doing. Now, again, I'm not naive. Huh? It's a bit like in climate negotiations where the $100 billion uh, that are promised uh, to developing countries is the oil in the machinery. Uh, if you compare it to a $95 trillion dollar global economy. Uh, there is much more money that flies around than investment decisions in the financial system. $100 billion uh, is a drop in the bucket. Uh, it flies around every day a couple of times in the financial system. So, But still, it is driving in a certain direction. Uh, and that's where I think we, we can still have an impact and an influence, even though Europe is becoming obviously a smaller part of this planet every single day in, in many measures. Huh? Well, great. Thank you so much. That's a very interesting um, set of responses and a fascinating talk. Um, I believe we'll be able to post your talk for those who weren't able to join us today. Um, and we are really grateful for you to share the European perspective with us. I think there's a great deal that can be learned from this exchange. Thank it you was so much my us. pleasure uh, to be with you. I hope to, uh, to, to actually come to Princeton uh, once, once we're able to do that again. Uh, I, on, I on purpose did not give you 25 graphs and tables and figures because I think framing this sort of sustainability transition trajectory in its key components to me was more important than giving you a bunch of scenarios and modeling exercises and graphs. So I indeed hope that it stimulated some, uh, some thinking and, and and also made it clear that we don't have the answers, but we're trying to frame uh, potential. Yeah, great. Well, thanks. Thanks again. All right. Thank you.